Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is the KCP Community Meeting, August 30th, 2022. Uh, if this is your first time here, we uh, are using a GitHub issue for our meeting agenda. Let me paste the link into the chat. Um, please feel free to add items as comments, and we will um, go from the top. So, uh, Paul, you were asking Adam if he wanted to talk about this issue at the meeting. So I see, Adam, you're here. Any interest? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so why don't you just give an overview of what you've got in here, and we can talk about it. Sure. Uh, so my team is building uh, basically Tecton as a service on top of KCP. Uh, and one of the most common uh, workloads that we'll be running on our service is building a container image. And those generally require some level of uh, elevated pod security per permissions. Um, Builda, for example, um, at minimum, it needs set FCAP. Uh, to be used um, upstream, uh, it's even more egregious. I think the build a Tecton Hub task right now, like ask for a privileged container, um, which we probably won't want want to allow. But um, that's the sort of kind of things that we're trying to weigh. And so um, our challenge is twofold. One is just for like any Kubernetes um, managing and uh, providing options where uh, the pod security admission uh, namespace labels can be synced in some capacity or controlled by something uh, and setting appropriate safeguards around that. Um, and the second one, and this is probably more out of scope for, for KCP in, because it's OpenShift specific, is then um, dealing with uh, OpenShift's security context constraints. Uh, so there's been uh, a little bit of discussion that's happened since I filed this issue. Um, SEC is probably going to be out. Uh, we uh, right now kind of are working around it just because of the nature of Tecton. Um, in order to run our service, like we have to deploy specific workload clusters that are configured with the OpenShift pipelines operator. And that provides us with SECs and uh, kind of like default service accounts. Uh, that make it easy to do this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, those are giving us potential um, security uh, attack vectors that we want to try and mitigate. So um, I think the main one here for us that we want to try and deal with is uh, uh, how we can sort of, or drive the discussion around uh, pod security emission labels. Okay, uh, this is not something I've looked at before. I know it's new. Um, and Stefan, you had suggested Sergius get involved yeah, here. He, he's out he right was now. Deeply, deeply involved in OpenShift recently in the changes, so he should know. I think we should just do another meeting with him okay. and discuss that and see where it can go. Yeah, I, I think Sergius is either currently on PTO or will be back later. Yeah, he's out know. in the afternoon, I think. OK, yeah. So I think the, the action item here is let's schedule a dedicated meeting to discuss this with Sergius, Adam, uh, Stefan, you want to be involved or leave it to them? Yeah, you can invite me. Yes. OK. Yeah. Um, can you include uh, Kahal O'Connor on that as well? Uh, do you know their GitHub? Yeah, I'll uh, add. Or feel free to. Comment. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to be the one to schedule that meeting. <laughs> um, so if, um, Adam, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking ownership on that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let me copy that. Is it the first one or the second one? Second one, sorry. OK, thanks. Um, so it sounds like we need Sergius uh, around. Anything else that you all know, wanted to um, chat about on this one before we move on to the next topic? Oh, OK, cool. Well, thanks for bringing that. Um, hopefully, we can get to some direction um, that will 
be useful for you and uh, not make things harder. Great. All righty. Uh, so that was the first item. Next up, um, and then we have a couple comments on this one. So Varsha, um, let me pull this one open. And let's talk about the uh, client scoping calls. And I think Steve probably can um, be involved here as well. So Varsha, over to you. Yeah, I think for the past uh, few weeks, we saw that a bunch of refactoring PRs have been going on. Those were related to scoping client calls in KCP, which basically removed the cluster interface and the cluster call on KCP and uh, cube types. So the idea which we initially followed was uh, either scoping the context or passing the rest config with a modified host. Uh, since the past few weeks, we had refactored a bunch of uh, packages in KCP. But unfortunately, we still need cluster interface for the listers uh, and the informers. So it didn't make sense to do the rework of keeping on uh, modifying and refactoring the code when there is no way for us to actually uh, stop the use of cluster interface right away. So based on a discussion with Steve, we decided that it would be nice to put a hard stop on whatever we are doing on client scoping right now and pick this up when the lister and informer gen is already done. So that will make us easier. A little bit of refactoring is needed right now, but it's more easier to do it at once when we remove the a fort code generator uh, right away and uh, then we can refactor it at once and apart from that there were also concerns uh, uh, in terms of this not being pretty clear for the users because cluster uh, scoped context is kind of a convoluted idea which the operator authors may not be much aware of so steve was also working on another pr which uh, created uh, which had a modified approach. So considering all those cases, uh, it was decided to put a hard stop with uh, the client scoping modification, at least for uh, 0 0.8. Uh, Steve, you can probably add uh, more context if you need. But uh, this was a quick update on this particular epic. No, totally. I think you nailed all of it. Um... So Steve, you have a, a Google Doc um, that it might be worth, I've got the link, might be worth um, at least commenting in this issue. If that's cool with you, I can just paste it in. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, definitely still work in progress. Um, we're looking for feedback, especially if you've gone through the process of taking a, an existing controller that is single uh, cluster scope and then migrating it to multi cluster scope, uh, like what that looked like. Did you expect to build on top of your existing one? Are you trying to have the same code base in between both contexts? Like everything around ergonomics there, I think we'd like to hear feedback. Um, and then there's this uh, specific uh, prototype in the API machinery pull where there's a couple rough edges around um, like how we use all of this stuff and what we expose. Um, if it's a, it's a bit dense. So do you think we should run through it in here? Or should we just uh, like ask people to come look? Um, I'm happy to go through it if folks are interested. But you are right there. <laughs> There's a lot here. So uh, if it's easier for people to look at this on their own time and provide some feedback, I think that could work as well. Um, I would encourage you all, if you're interested, to, to look at the files that have been changed and look at this example main function that is in here for what it looks like to interact with things that are both cluster scoped and namespace scoped, where um, you may be uh, just kind of doing things the old way, where you uh, once you scope to a particular logical cluster or workspace, then everything is just normal, so to speak, or um, deferring scoping until later. So I, I think there's good examples in here that um, can make it a little bit more, uh, I don't know, digestible than uh, this yes. big list here. <laughs> yeah, that was more for more for us. And I think one of the big questions that I might have to do, like a little bit of a existing literature review to see how often people use the 
like how often are people scoping a client to a particular namespace and then using that? Are there controllers that always expect to be in the same namespace regardless of the installation? Does that even make any sense? Because <laughs> um, I think the biggest tension just comes between existing code that expects to be within a particular namespace and what that means for a cross-cluster context. But yeah, um, feedback is greatly appreciated. And even if this has been uh, ergonomics of things that you've done in KCP itself, because we're using both approaches now um, with Varsha's work, and so, yeah. OK, um, thank you, Varsha and Steve. So if you're writing controllers or clients, please take a look at this and let us know what you like and what you don't like um, so that we can get to um, clients and generators that work as well as they can for everybody. All right, uh, next up we have Vu about the catalog design overview. Um, yes, hi everyone. I'm um, sorry, there's also a duplicated uh, comment for me on that. It's okay. That's right, it's the same story. So yeah, I just want to give just a quick introduction to the new catalog API that uh, Basha and I have been working on for the past couple of weeks uh, under the guidance of uh, Andy and Stefan here. Um, this is just, um, and there's obviously a new repo that you can see here, the catalog repo that we currently try to push a few code in. And uh, at, at the moment, it isn't having a lot except for this PR. This is literally the first PR pretty much to having all the code and all the discussion going on here. So it's just a new API that we try to develop that kind of filling the gap between the API export and the API binding that we currently have. It's kind of lay, uh, laying on top of the API export because having quite a lot of references to the API export that we have here, and then eventually uh, will be a mechanism to binding this cap information to create API binding um, to able to using the API in your workspace. And this pretty much just uh, the concept catalog is is rather uh, pretty much familiar for everyone here. I guess it's just basically a collection uh, of all the API that available on the cluster for you to use if you ever want to use it. And this cap facilitating um, ability to you know, get the information that you need from the API export, but at the same time adding some additional information that can be helpful from a UI console perspective that you can see a lovely UI with, you know, information that you need about the API that you want to use and eventually binding that into the workspace that you uh, have desired to using it in. And at the moment, the, um, everything's still pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty early stage, I put it that way. Um, there's still a lot of changing on the spec that happening in this particular PR that you know Andy and everyone having comment on that, and I'm pretty much pushing changes pretty much daily, hourly to a certain extent to keep everything um, addressed and up to date as much as possible. So we just having a few current tasks here just to basically sketch out API and get the feedback on that and see what do we need to have uh, in 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 relation to the API export and also in relation with the API binding that we need to have to make sure the, uh, the user can see the information that they need to, to have to make a you know, kind of an informed decision if they want to use it or not, kind of thing. And also, um, uh, basically, create a kind of a simple workflow from the CI command perspective to just basically create API binding based on, in, based on the information on the catalog entry that we have here. And that pretty much the current going on work that we have been working on for this, for this specific PR, and hopefully, after we accomplish this current task, we're gonna merge this PR for the first step. And then um, there are future uh, tasks after that that we try to expand this a bit further like with a certain thing that, you know, having more command to facilitate more, you know, useful uh, feature for that. And also having kind of a controller to adding certain rec reconciliation process to this specific uh, API, you know, validation uh, and all sort of, you know, lifecycle management of that API um, and so on. And also to kind of elevating uh, this API a bit further to make it a little bit having certain separation from the API export as well. At the moment, it's relying pretty heavily on some of the um, API uh, uh, and the references uh, on the API export itself to make sure that we can kind of link them together. But in the future, we probably just want to keep it kind of a, uh, a separate ident identifier that you can link it to API export 
but without expose the APX export too much, given the fact that um, the user, technically speaking, doesn't need to know about APX export. That's something that the catalog entry can find the references to without need to expose the APX export and where it is and what kind of other you know, sensitive information that associate with the APX export that we do not wish to expose too much and leaking it too much. So that is something uh, for the future tasks that we try to explore. But at the moment, it's just pretty much about the uh, API spec and uh, the initial uh, CUI command to make it create a, a simple workflow out of that. And that's pretty much what uh, Basha and I have been working on. And I just want to make an introduction here for everyone if they um interested in this uh, API. Feel free to have any comment on the PR, any kind of you know, question, feel to put it on the on Slack and we will and, you know guide you and you know if you want to contribute, that's even better. And that pretty much um the main talk for today. That's all. Thanks, Vu. So um just to re-highlight what Vu was saying at the end, uh, if you're not familiar with why we're doing this, it's because we uh, we don't want users to necessarily have to know the details about individual API exports across a handful or dozens or however many workspaces that they may come from. And so this offers a way to centralize APIs and services that are available on KCP as a platform. And uh, so within a single workspace that has catalog entries or you know, within a single catalog, so to speak, it can have um, pointers to exports coming from lots of different workspaces. So that's the motivation among other things. Um, Paul, go ahead. Has there been any discussion on the ability to have multiple catalogs? Like it, it it would basically be different workspaces, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did mention on the what's the API catalog a little bit the fact that we try to using workspace concept to encapsulating the collection of a you know collection of catalog entry, and if you want um, a catalog with a set of um, um, catalog entry, then they basically belong to one single catalog, and if you having you know, want to having another catalog, you can having another workspace and, you know, adding more catalog entry into it. That's currently the separation of what it means to be a catalog at the moment. So you could have a hierarchical sharing of catalogs? Correct. Yeah. So I did mention there about the, the organization there. So uh, wherever the workspace belong to certain path, certain root uh, path, then where that's supposed to be the, the visibility of that catalog. I see. Um, go ahead, Chris. Um, since we will probably have services from one tenant that are being offered to users that would be in a, a different tenant, is that a conversation on how you would expose catalogs across workspace? Um, has that already been captured in comment somewhere? I can just go and read. Uh, or is that a use case that's been considered? Stefan, I'll let you take that one because I got distracted by what you were typing in Slack. <laughs> yeah, so basically, the access permissions of the global workspace make sure that not everybody can blindly submit something. So it's more like a submission model for global availability. And of course, every every tenant can have their own workspace which has those entries and can use that easily and can have their own process of submission and. Uh, auditing or whatever is necessary. But basically, creating a catalog entry is privileged. There might be a process on top which makes it available for everybody to submit. OK, so if you want so to have global reach, I, th I think so. If you want to have global reach, you need to have an entry effectively in the root workspace. Yeah, now, not root, but it's root colon catalog, maybe something like that. Some yeah, kind of global workspace, which is the default when you use a tool it's like the CLI to point to root catalog. Okay. All right, and the, the, the permission system to bind again, this is based on exports. So everything about permissions to do the binding actually is then um, another step after visibility and um, using a CLI. So this is mostly about visibility. If we talk right. about security here. Right. I'm, I'm thinking about the ergonomics of discovery and exposure. 
like can we allow tenants that want to expose their services to other tenants to be able to do that without having to go through some central place but to register a thing like is there a way that we can yeah, make this happen will be the data it will be central plus a process to okay. qualify for being in the global catalog okay thanks all right go ahead joe uh i was just curious if there's a notion of and, and i know there's like mentions of the word group in here but like in terms of like a group of API exports that someone might want to consume somewhat atomically. Like, for example, Cert Manager has both issuers and certificates, and it might not make sense to import a certificate without an issuer or vice versa. So is maybe, I don't know if this is a good question for this topic, but like, is there a notion of saying, like, as an API importer, I want the Cert Manager APIs uh, as a whole? Yeah, so there, there's two levels to that. One is that a single API export can export multiple types. So you could have a cert manager export that exports both issuers and certificates and anything else. Okay. Right. Um, the, the next level up is, well, what if I need multiple API exports together to consider that like a logical unit or service? And there's a discussion in this comment about export name as to whether or not um, we should have a one-to-one -one relationship between one catalog entry and one API export, or should a single catalog entry support multiple API exports? Um, my opinion here is that let's be flexible and just have an array, and then we don't have to worry about coming back later and converting from a single value to multiple. Cool. Thanks. All right. So um, if you're interested in, in this topic, as usual, please take a look at some comments. Um, if you want to help out with the code, um, that would be awesome as well. So uh, thank you, Boo. All right. Stefan, you are up next. Yeah. So. This topic has come up a couple of times, especially when new people join. So our documentation situation is not good. And um, we have lots of old stuff in the repository. We lack new documentation. And I would propose an experiment, which if it works, we can repeat it, maybe even integrate it into our sprint process every month. I would propose to um, add two days of doc only work doc days basically after we tag 08, which might be on Friday or Monday or something like that. We will discuss that, I guess, at some point. And on those two days, which follow the tagging, nobody or everybody is forced basically not to do any coding, like only docs, writing docs, maybe creating YouTubes, anything in this direction as well. But coding is basically um, not allowed in the project. So two days of pure doc work. And if we decide this makes sense, maybe we can start a Google Doc with issues, or we can take issues maybe which we want to work on, that everybody has something. I would add maybe one additional constraint. Everything that people work on should be finished in some way, and this depends. I mean, the PR could be merged or mergeable at least at the end of the two days. So not that we start stuff and it's just laying there, like our readme work. We have a readme PR, I think, up for months or at least weeks. We would try to close those things. So two days, and after two days, things should be mergeable. And the question is, is this something we should do? I like the idea. I don't think we can do it without at least a little bit of coordination. So I like your idea of some sort of document or some way to organize who's doing what. Um, we could do that. We could have a, um, a GitHub project where we file issues and order them in different columns, if that makes sense. Um, I see Paul uh, maybe has some ideas there. So over to you, Paul. 
Yeah, I was going to say I love the idea of getting a repo into some sort of good shape. And I also just wanted to throw the suggestion out there on whether or not we want to consider updating our epic template or our definition of done so that it does include the maintenance of those sorts of documents. I think it could be a checkbox on there, yeah. Um, Steve. Um, I think, too, we should be good documentation will take review. And so I just want to make sure that we're putting enough time in there so that there's actually like back and forth and not just this is a document I wrote. <laughs> we merged it. Um, I, but at the same time, I get that you know asking for three or four days is, is harder. But I don't know. Four, four half days might be better. It should be mergeable at the end of the second day. If we review, that's another thing. There is no no urgency to merge, but just the size of the things we try to tackle should be in two days or should fit two days. I see. Yeah, I just meant like mindset being, you know, does it read well? Does it answer the questions of the audience we're working on? Not can I finish it in two days? <laughs> but yeah, totally. This would be good. All right. So I think if we proceed with this before, uh, so like we're going to tag 0 0.8, and then we're going to start a couple of doc days. Before we get to that point, we should have a list of topics and rough assignees so that it's not everybody doing the same thing or not having any idea what to work on come next week. And there's obviously going to be a tension as well between like, do we ask author A to write about the feature they wrote, or do we ask someone else to do it with the understanding that somebody else's docs are going to be less likely to gloss over things, right? But will take longer to write. Yeah. Um, so how do you all want to track topic ideas and organize this? Is it, does a Google Doc make more sense, or should we try to use um, a project board in GitHub? I'd love to see issues close. What's that, yeah, Paul? Can we, can we get, oh, sorry, Paul? I, I'd love to see issues opened and closed as we complete docs. OK. Um, so I can set up a board for this, or a portion of a board. And maybe we can just look at. I, I know right now we're probably also pulling in that you know back catalog of docs we're missing, but we can look at merged features as well in the last couple of weeks. Okay, um, so before we tag zero point eight, I will get a board set up and try to pull issues in that we already have and see about adding some more. Uh, this is open to anybody, so you don't have to wait for me to do that. If there's a specific feature or part of KCP that you'd like to see documented or to see the documentation improved, uh, please just file an issue. You can go to new issue. Um, we'll, I don't know. You could pick a template or just do a blank issue. I mean, it's not really like a bug report. So, and if you do, Feature request, yeah, I don't even, it's not this. So I would just open up a blank issue and um, do slash kind documentation in your um, description or in a comment. And then that will get the label set up appropriately if you don't have um, labeling permissions. All right. OK. Um, anything else on doc days before we um, move on? OK. Uh, we talked about this one already. So uh, OK to skip over it, Steve? Yep. OK. So um, I wanted to let folks know that a pull request has merged to um, to main, which lets you do quota of things that are cluster scoped. 
So right now, this is the docs. Uh, so inside a workspace, you create a namespace called admin, and then you create a resource quota instance, and you put this annotation on there. And then you can do object count um, quota for both namespace and cluster scoped resources. If you do it on a namespace scoped resource, like a config map, this will count and limit instances across all namespaces in that workspace. And if it's a cluster scoped resource, it will just limit instances at the cluster level or at the workspace level. So this should work for, like, if you want to quota how many namespaces you can have or how many work how many child workspaces you can have, this should do that. There is an end-to-end -end test for this that uh, validates that it works. Um, there may be some edge cases uh, here and there. So if you try this out and you run into any problems, please let us know. Um, but this, right now, we can do both um, normal namespace scoped quota, where you can set a resource quota in any namespace that's already there. The new feature is just for being able to do things at the, the workspace or cluster scope. Uh, so please try it out. Let us know how it goes. Um, it is marked experimental in the annotation because we're not certain that this is going to be the final solution. So rather than um, promising that it is, <laughs> we went with air experimental here. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm excited that it's there, so please try it out. All right, um, one last topic for the time being from Lionel about DNS support. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Um, so I'm trying to install um, Kennedy on top of uh, KCP, and uh, one of the things that is missing currently in KCP is uh, DNS resolution, so Kennedy is uh, rely uh, on a lot on service discovery and um, and, and so this PR is really about uh, adding uh, you know DNS uh, uh, resolution in a physical cluster right so like mapping uh, um, workspace namespaces to uh, physical uh, namespaces um, I'm aware this is like a, a big PR uh, it has like a, a change in the uh, kind of uh, user facing uh, uh, command, uh, like it adds a new um, DNS uh, image, right? So you have like a new uh, argument on the KCP uh, sinker, I think. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, because it's uh, so uh, basically what it does, it creates. Uh, uh, so before uh, you had to create only uh, a sinker. But now you need to create a sinker and a, a, a DNS bug, uh, right? Um, so I mean, it's been working for me uh, and also for Joachim. Joachim uh, uh, and uh, so I can almost run uh, Kennedy uh, fully. Uh, and I'm aware of uh, one issue with uh, old version of Envoy. Uh, but now it's been fixed in Envoy. So I think now it's kind of working. Um, and at this point, I guess I'm looking for feedback. Thanks. Um, yeah, this has been on my to-do list to take a look at, but I have not had time yet. Um, so hopefully I can get there. And uh, if anybody else has core DNS background, networking background, um, please take a look. We will do our best to get some more eyes on this as soon as we can. And thank you for putting this together. You're welcome. Uh, any any questions or comments for Lionel? Not seeing anything. Paul, you went off off mute for a second. I was just going to confirm. My understanding is this allows service level DNS resolution on physical clusters by remapping the service name. Yeah, service name, right? Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So the um, I had filed this issue back in February about uh, if you have a pod in namespace one and it's referencing a service in some other namespace, in this case two, uh, because we change the names of the namespaces when we sync things down to a physical cluster, how would that work? So that answers your question, Paul, that 
this is doing that mapping in Cordian S, right? Lionel? Yeah, this is great. Yep, okay. And then we have a related issue about um, that you had filed, Lionel, about wanting to um, do this with um, if you're in the same namespace. So, um, yeah, this is cool. I'm glad to see this. And um, folks, please try it out if you can and give some feedback. And like I said, we'll try and get eyes on this as soon as we can, um, but it may be after we tag 0 0.8 at the end of the week. Great, thank you. All right. Um, any other topics that anybody wants to chat about before we go take a look and just do issue triage? OK, uh, if you think of anything, feel free to speak up. I'm going to go look at the issues that don't have a milestone set real quick. 15, all right. Um, OK, this one I found. it's some sort of uh, cluster scoping lacking when we have the uh, when we run with uh, the front proxy and sharding. So uh, this one just needs to be looked at fixed. I don't know the priority on this one. So the the controller that's failing is one that's creating a, uh, what was this? I think it creates a config map that um, folks are supposed to use if you're doing webhooks for getting the CA. So we probably should fix this. Because um, the other option is just to, to disable this controller. But I, I think it sounds like we need it. It's to authenticate incoming webhook requests, I think. That's really coming from API server, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to put TBD. And when we do 0 09 planning, maybe we'll pull it in. Um, next up expose the list of available workspace types to a user. Priority wise, um, Steve, since you filed this, uh, is TBD OK? Or do you want to try and pull this into 0 09 uh, preemptively? No, I think TBD makes sense. And potentially, there's some catalog style approach here as well. OK. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Um, Yeah, we should fix this. <laughs> um, some of this has to do with the work I did a while ago, just getting CRDs and bindings and whatnot working. And I think I might have left it to do somewhere that, you know, oops, we, we don't have open API for bound CRDs. Um, I'm going to put this on. I had a discussion with Steve in Slack. Um, it's a little sensitive to do that. Like if we do it in a dump way, yeah. we will, I mean, the server will die in CPU yeah. and memory consumption. But if somebody wants to look into that, um, I'm happy to give pointers. Yeah, so this is under API exports. I also, um, I think, obviously, having this dynamically for bound APIs in a workspace would be awesome. But I think for people trying to wrap their brain around KCP itself, having this even in a semi-static published state would be awesome just so they could explore the API, uh, visually generate clients for non-Go SDKs, just for our built-in types that we know. Yeah, makes sense. Do you want to add that comment, Steve? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I put this in TBD, um, but yeah, we should definitely get around to this. So uh, we'll reconsider for zero nine planning. 
what is this one? Allow syncing of special resources from the sync target to the workspace. Um, yeah, I think this one, we need more information from Chayton, I think. Because it sounded like maybe this is already done. Um, so let me... Uh, and, sorry. Enhance documentation. A documentation label. And the, if you all um, disagree or have comments on anything here, please uh, speak up. Uh, this one. Oh yeah. So uh, this is one where you have an API binding. It's valid. It's all good. You create a second binding that conflicts with the first. So the second one is not valid because it has naming conflicts. You delete the first one. The second one, in theory, should be resolved and not have any conflicts anymore. But it's not processed unless you wait for the resync to come in or you label the binding or do something to get it updated to be reprocessed. So this is just about being uh, a little bit more aggressive with processing things. OK. Um, Stefan, I'm going to defer to you on the cache server ones or Lukash uh, in terms of milestone. So I think we can put that one on hold since we don't know we will be moving forward with exactly. scoping clients. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks. Um, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is definitely a, a good first issue if folks are looking for um, starting to contribute. Um, so we have the ability to turn on or off the built-in Go pprof profiler for the KCP binary process, but we don't have that for the standalone virtual workspaces server or the front proxy. Uh, and I've, I've put in a link um, here. I guess we have we do have somebody who's interested in working on this. So um, we'll see uh, if, if it doesn't come through. Uh, it could be available, but I uh, forgot about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. We have a request to add a workspace tree subcommand. Um, let's see. Is Luca here? No. And I think there was a request for some code. So maybe that we just need to do some more direction here. But that's definitely TBD. Next up is, uh, oh, this was one of my, um, like the inverse permission claim thing that we were talking about, Stefan. So the idea here is that I'm an API provider. I own an API export. I own the schemas. Uh, you are a consumer of my API. And when you consume my API, I want to provision and manage some things, maybe their resource quotas or config maps or who knows what. And I want to uh, create those things in your workspace. And even if you have cluster admin in your workspace, you are not allowed to edit these things. So um, I think Sergius is working on that. Yes, all right. I think zero, zero 08 actually, uh, zero 09, sorry. Next milestone might make sense. OK. Ah. Thanks. Uh, OK, we have a label length exceeded. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested, this is probably some issues. On that one, uh, we talked about the 
this one. So I'm just going to pop it into TBD pending that meeting. Uh, this one, server-side apply requests to virtual workspaces fail. Uh, and it should be an upsert instead of failing. So yeah, we should get around to doing this. And I believe there's a PR that um, exists for that as well, which is cool. Uh, let's see, make this easier. These two are definitely just TBD. So this one is about getting rid of uh, getting rid of our mappings file that the front proxy uses. <laughs> And instead of having flags for that, and then this um, this is a good first issue as well. So inside of um, this file, once my PR merges because it's new, uh, just turning the uh, log here saying starting virtual workspaces server to include the uh, full command line with all parameters instead of just this one index. So uh, that is the end of those. And let's look at the milestone epics. Um, priority and fairness. Mike, I see you're here. Do you have an update on anything going on there? Yeah. Um, Jamie's been looking at the um, thing that uh, you merged for the quota. And I think he's got enough of an understanding that he's ready to start uh, trying it for the analogous thing for APF. OK, awesome. Um, so we have that for, oh, let me, I realize that's now scheduled for 0 09, which is good, because <laughs> I doubt it'll get in by the end of the week. Um, right. But thank yeah. you for the update. I, I do really appreciate it. All right, so multi-release epic sharding. Where are we with 0 0.84 here? It looks like everything's in for 0 0.8. Is that right? Um, so yeah. So at the moment, I'm working on the cache server. So you know, the server will host resources that are required by other shards. So the idea is instead of pushing data into onto individual shards we'll collect them at a central place. And this is this is still in progress at the moment. So this is something I, I'm working on. Some parts have been merged already, but not everything. Okay, so but there's 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 design documents for the current uh, thinking? Mm, not really. Some, some thoughts, but uh, nothing really. It would probably specific. be useful to, to maybe pause a little bit and at least sketch out something in a Google Doc and drawings if you need to. There are two days coming for documentation. True. Great topic. All right. Okay. Uh, but in, in terms of like what's in the task list here, everything for 0 0.8 is done, right? Um, yeah. OK, so I'm going to move this to 0 0.9. So we stop looking at it for right now. Thank you. OK. Uh, export permissions on binding. Uh, I know Sean has um, been pulled back into his day job, so to speak. So um, we did this one. Thank you, Sean and Nolan, on that. That's awesome. Um, I think we probably need to come back here and decide what we need here. I mean, given the amount of time that's available, I think, Stefan, we might want to just move this to um, after 0 0.8. Oh, yeah, of course. And the CLI command, maybe it's even something somebody else can work on. Interesting topic. Yeah. So, so what is All right, I'll come back and look at this one. Maybe, Nolan, we can talk about this um, as, a, as something you could potentially work on. And I think we're, we're basically good for permission claims for 0 0.8. Um, I'll, I'll offline come back and clean this up. Uh, quota support, we have this, this, this. This and this is um, 
not specific to quota. Um, so the second one here we talked about for the inverse permission claims, this one is um, just being a, a controller and creating things. So I think we can call quota for right now done. Uh, I'll move these things out and make it clear they're not for quota. And then the next epic for quota will be distributed or aggregated quota where you can define limits in a parent workspace and have that in some shape or form apply to all of the ancestors, or about the ancestors, all of the descendants. Uh, so I will close this one out after the meeting. Uh, Multi-workspace controller development. I think the, the big theme there we've already touched on in terms of what we're doing with scoping and cluster aware informers and listers. Um, I'm going to move this to 0 0.9 unless anybody feels like we're going to try and rush to finish this by the end of the week. Steve, Varsha. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then the last couple here, location workspaces and whatnot. Um, maybe, uh, Stefan, you've been keeping more of an eye on this one, right? Yeah, I think most things are in uh, this one PR up, and this should merge. I forgot the name. There was a stack. So I yeah. They, yeah. Um, but it probably would be so, nice to, to come back in and like clean up some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so can, maybe you can add, um, um, which one? 1828 is the one which has to merge. Okay. And 1779 does not. So it's uh, not here. Maybe we can. Yeah. There's the two PRs that fix the two open issues that are linked here. I'm removed. Yeah, but review. that's another one. All right. I'll, I'll come back in and, and get okay. stuff in there. Um, Steve pointed out, uh, Varsha, you had your hand up earlier when I was talking about permission claims. Did I? Um, I'm sorry if I missed you. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, uh, nothing. It was related to the uh, KCP byte command. We were just talking about including that in the catalog epic. So yeah, nothing important. Okay, yeah. Sorry for, for missing you. Thanks. It, it, it's a good idea. Maybe it should be one command for both. So, so we should discuss it together. With, uh, yeah. Kirk. All right. And then the last one here is on burst tunneling. I know um, Antonio has been doing a lot of work here, and we have some PRs up. Um, do we want to try and review and merge this? this yeah, week? so I think it's, it's not complete, but I think it's a good uh, step in between, which we can merge. So it's not yet that you have pod and pod blocks as a normal URL. But you need to specify a special minus minus four parameter to cube cuttle. But um, at least this is in and the sinker would connect to KCP with a tunnel. So a, a major part of the story is done in this PR. Can we feature gate this? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. At least the uh, sinker part should be. Yeah, the the hand or the routes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've got some cleanup stuff to do. That is the last of the epics for zero point eight. So I'd say we're out of time, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.